Hey everybody, Corey here, and you see me in the middle of the day, so that means that we once again have somebody very special on the show. Actually, we have two very special people on the show today, and I was talking to them before we started recording, so I can tell you right now, this is going to be not only very interesting, but this is going to be a lot of fun to talk to these two guys today. Please welcome our guest here on Double Toasted Interviews, Ron Cicero and... Kimo Easterwood. I think I got your names right. You did indeed. Nice. Nice. I'm I'm not going to lie. I'm bad with names, man, when I meet people for the first time. So if I say your name wrong the first time, please don't get offended, which I didn't. So thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, these guys, man, I was talking to them before, especially uh, uh, Kimo, man. And I, I, you know, we were talking about some interesting things. We even had to kind of pull back because we were getting into these things uh, before we started recording. Uh, they are the directors of Happy, Happy, Joy, Joy. And this is a documentary that, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a uh, celebration of the pioneering show Ren and Stimpy, which kind of took somewhat of a slightly dark turn after you finished the documentary. Am I correct? That would be 100% correct, sir. Yeah, Corey, it was, you know, it was interesting. Um, we had the original cut of the film. It was done in about a year and a half. We had interviewed at that point, I don't know, 60 plus people and had a strong story about just celebrating Ren and Stimpy. And mm -hmm. it was, the, you know, kind of this overlooked show. It was kind of discarded as just this gross out cartoon that had a few short years on the air. But, you know, it really is extraordinary from an artistic standpoint, from the standpoint of where it fits in animation history. So we were pretty pleased and we sent it to Viacom who you know licensed us the footage but wasn't involved in the film and they loved it and then two days later this news breaks about John Kay and his his very dark past and we kind of panicked and like oh boy uh, now we have a toxic film what do we do and <laughs> you know he had refused to be interviewed up till then but um, when this news broke he he changed his mind which then we were like well what do we do do we interview him we include him in the film you know, the tricky part was that what happened occurred well after the production of the show. So it's like, how do you integrate Robin and Katie's story into a film, A, that's done, and B, from a chronological standpoint, was, you know, it was outside the bounds of our original story. Yeah. So. I'm going to show a trailer of this uh, in a moment, but Kimo, do you have anything that you want to add before I do that? Uh, no, just so from what Ron was saying, we had a very difficult um few months there more than a few months of trying to integrate the uh the third last third of the film you know it just once mm -hmm. john became involved and we really had to dial back and figure out like how this was all going to work how we're going to include him we we tried um many many different options on <laughs> not only uh robin's story but john himself you know um we tried all kinds of different um ways of renewing our, our our original film and and making it something great so um yeah just it was a lot lot of work yeah involved. the uh the dark moment that we're talking about here now for anybody who's familiar with ren and stimpy and mostly the director or the, and the creator of ren and stimpy uh john crick Faluski, often goes by john k the dark turn that this took was that during the hashtag me too movement it came out that he had an inappropriate relationship with a very young minor, Robin Bird. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But for right now, let's go ahead and show you guys the trailer, a little bit of the trailer for Happy, Happy, Joy, Joy. It was just like you lived in the kingdom of John. And he's sick. Is there anything you would have done differently? I shut the camera off. I'll give you a super honest answer. <laughs> You know, again, you can see how that, where that took a, took a turn for the unexpected, I'm sure, when you guys are working on this. Uh, you know, let, let me, let, I'm going to put this on both of you for a moment just to give some people a little background about yourselves. Uh, between the both of you, you have an amazing history and an amazing uh, uh, resume. Uh, Ron, uh, you produced a lot of commercials 
You've done some shorts too. Uh, you worked with people like Judd Apatow, uh, Chemo. You've been a photographer. You worked with uh, people like uh, a lot of people in the music business, uh, and, and uh, in the entertainment business. Chris Rock, uh, ZZ Top, uh, Bon Jovi, Usher. Um, you're also uh, an artist. Fine artists have had your work shown in in a, in a lot of places. So, with all your experience that you have out there, uh, and all the people that you've worked with. Why a documentary about Ren and Stimpy and its creator? Well, we always, um, you know, working in the film industry, I guess, um, you know, Ron, Ron was working in the production side of it, which could be soul uh, sucking at times, which he will admit. <laughs> so um, he was looking to get out and do something completely different and artistic. And I was at the same point in, in my life where I was like, we, we just wanted to get out and sh do something different. We wanted to shoot something ourselves instead of shooting something for someone else. So um, Todd White, who is an artist that's in the show, he had come to me uh, over the years. He kept saying, hey, you know, he was friends with John Candy. He kept saying, hey, you should... Um, you should do a documentary on this guy, John. Like he did this Ren and Stimpy show. He's a really interesting guy and always kind of, I didn't really blow it off, but I just didn't have the means to sort of get something like that done. So, um, so then this kind of timed out perfectly. Ron was looking to do something and then, you know, this idea came up and we just sort of like, well, let's look into it. Let's see what this is all about. So yeah. we just started doing research. We started looking at episodes I had never watched an episode of Ren and Stimpy and Ron had watched one episode. So we started watching episodes and digging up all any kind of archival interviews we could on John and and just Wikipedia, whatever. And um, within, you know, like an hour, we called each other and we we're like, yeah, we, we got to do this. This is this is going to be our next project, something we know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's uh, interesting to hear because. You guys put this together. Now, let me just honestly say, I am a I am a big uh, Ren and Stimpy fan. Uh, I was even going to say thank you guys for taking me back to uh, some good memories of the time when this first came out. Uh, I I was a uh, I was a, a freshman in college when this came out, and it absolutely blew my mind. Now, so I'm an old school fan. Uh, you know what what what's it like being guys? You know coming into this phenomena years later after it's, after it's done and just now finding out about it? Because it is a crazy cartoon even to this day. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I think one of the real benefits of having that distance, like we were just a little bit outside of the college age then, like, you know, a couple of years. So we were already in the workplace and, and weren't really paying attention. We didn't have kids yet, so we wouldn't have watched it when, you know, with our kids. Um, so it, it gave us a real... Um, a distance, which is really helpful because you can imagine once you dive into this cartoon, there's so many things to like about it that you can really kind of get lost in the minutia as, you know, as a fan, because eh? it's really easy to become a hardcore fan, right? So it, having that distance and really looking at it in retrospect helped us tell the story from a global perspective. So we're not just dealing or diving into things that may be a little too esoteric for a wider audience. And that's, that was always really our, our, um, our goal was to, to have a film that more than just the hardcore fan could appreciate. You yeah. know, we hope people that maybe never even heard of the show see the film and go, oh my God, this is really, you know, artistically uh, phenomenal. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Kimo, what about you, man? You know, because it, it blew my mind when you told me, like, yeah, I, I didn't know what this shit was until we started doing a documentary. So <laughs> I was like, wow, man, you did you did such a good job. It seemed like guys who love this. Well, you know, it's not once you watch the show for the first time, it's not hard to love it. You know, um, when when you can look at it through, um, you know, an art, art, artistic eye and sort of separate yourself from, you know, when you're 15 years old, you're not thinking about the the art of it and all the, yeah. you know, the, the jokes that are flying under the radar, you don't think about any of that stuff, you know, yeah. um, it's just more visual for you. But as an adults, we could get the subtle humor and you can appreciate, you know, cause the show was, was pure analog the first couple of years. So, uh, you know, it's all hand drawn. And when you realize the amount of work that goes into it, you know, kids now it's, it's all Centiques and, 
and and uh, computer. But back then, you know, you don't have the appreciation for having to draw every single frame, you know. And then these guys were, you know, they would finish drawing the show and then they would spend another four hours in a music studio trying to write music for their show, which is something that's unheard of that no one would ever do now. You know, you'd have four different departments to do that now. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so we could just really appreciate it, at least, you know, on that level of how much work went into it. And then also the environment they were coming into, you know, um, now you come up with something shocking. It's like, well, you know, there's a lot of shocking things, but back in 1990, 91, yeah. there's not a lot of shocking things that were preceding the show. So you can, um, you can just really appreciate the sort of the struggle they had trying to get this crazy thing off the air. And, um, and I, I give, you know, props not only to the, the RNS crew, but to Vanessa, you know, Vanessa was just a massive part of this show. You know, she put all her chips on the line and said, there's something here and I'm going to make it happen. And she yeah. did. So, so she gets mad props for that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. If anybody's not from, you know, there's a, we have a very young audience, uh, you know, combined with some of the older people that watch and uh, listen to our show, too. Uh, for some of the younger people out there, you know, it's, it's it could be easy to take for granted uh, the change that uh, Ren and Stimpy made in animation. I have an animation background myself. And, uh, you know, I remember watching this and just being completely blown away to this day. I still think that, uh, you know, it's a it's a genius property in so many areas. Happy, happy, joy, joy, the title of your documentary uh, is I think in the within the con context of the show is a genius not only a, a genius song but just a genius episode a genius moment in animation. Uh, again, if people aren't familiar with Red and Stimpy because you might be a little bit younger, uh, here's one of the most iconic episodes that they made. Uh, the one where. Ren, who was a very, 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 uh, uh, they just call him an asshole, pretty much. <laughs> you know, that's what, that's what, that's the way he's actually described by John Krikbaluska, the creator. Uh, and just angry, has anger problems. Stimpy is uh, just goofy, aloof, may, <laughs> might, might, might even say he's mentally challenged. He makes a device to try to make Ren happy all the time, and it turns into pretty much a very horrific episode for him. <laughs> happy, happy, George. Now you can even see that they did they really pushed the limits like even simple things that we might take for granted today just animating ass cheeks like this putting an emphasis <laughs> on that <laughs> it would, would would pretty much upset censors back then so even doing that was revolutionary wow. uh and animation for 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 what is considered a kids show uh you know, I, like I said, you guys did such a good job with your research, man. Uh, you know, and, and I, I half my questions I had to scrap because I have, a lot of them were like, well, obviously you're big fans of the show. And, you know, I figured we talk about the history and what your first love uh, of Stimpy and, and Ren were. But that's not the case. So, you know, a, a big kudos to you for doing such a, a great job on researching this and, and talking to people behind the show. Thank you, man. Yeah. You know, there's so many things that we couldn't fit in there. Which is, you know, I mean, this thing could have been 17 hour long documentary. I mean, just on that happy, happy, joy, joy song, you know, that we have people describing how they came up with that song. And then the, the different artists jumping on planks of wood to make that sound, that plank wood sound here when they're they're all jumping on the ground. Yeah. We, have, we have insight into all this. We just unfortunately couldn't fit everything in there. With uh, with this cartoon and it being so revolutionary, there were people who were definitely and you stress this a lot. And you in the in the people in the documentary, they stress this a lot. How, you know, we were doing things that uh, we were sneaking things into this cartoon. Uh, mm -hmm. We were doing things that just no one else would even think of uh, presenting to uh, uh, the, the you know the executives and, and censors over at a, a children's station. Uh, you know, but a lot of these people they say you know of course to work with somebody who has such a vision. And to also push the envelope in areas like this, you work with somebody that's kind of hard to work with. Uh, and then you get this dark history that comes up about the person that they work for. And I was reading about how it took it took a long time, quite a few months for you to get people to even talk about uh, the documentary uh, or to get them to come on and say anything. So 
Uh, was that because of John Krikvaluski's allegations, or was it because no one wanted to badmouth the legacy and the history of this, or was it a combination of a lot of things? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, when when John left the show or was fired from the show, it was like a professional divorce because some people went with him and some people chose to go to games, which was Nickelodeon's upstart studio, mm -hmm. to continue doing the show. And, you know, the, unfortunately, as brilliant as those first couple of years were, it, you know, from a uh, financial standpoint and production standpoint, it was just untenable. They, they weren't delivering. Advertisers were upset. <laughs> you know, the show was going to get canceled if, if they didn't write the ship. And John is so detail oriented and, and, you know, he's a true artist that it was really hard for him to, you know, let go of things that, that you know, sometimes you got to make those compromises. And, you know, kudos to him for not making those compromises at times, because now we're talking about it 30 years later. But from a network point of view and from, you know, a financial point, that's, you know, you got to do that. So it, it, it was... And, and, you know, this is something that John had for in his head for years. So you can imagine the devastation to him when he left and the anger that he felt. So yeah. it was like basically calling up a whole bunch of people and saying, look, I know you don't know us, but would you like to talk about the most painful professional divorce of your career in a show that was supposed to change the world and was only on for a couple of years? <laughs> and so... You can imagine people weren't like super excited to talk about it. They're like, oh, we finally buried the hatchet and now these two come along. So that was that was some of the real challenge, you know, in the beginning. But fortunately, Bill Ray, he was one of the first that said, all right, sure, we'll give it a shot. And then once word spread that we weren't trying to do a hit piece or what have you, um, that that definitely helped. And, you know, having Bill go, you know what, these guys are OK. They're, they're trying to do the right thing here. So. Um, whether who knew about what about John, you know, it's hard to say because again, the Robin stuff um, happened after you know a lot of the people's tenure on the show. Mm -hmm. You know, when John left, uh, other people left, and you know, a lot of people hadn't talked to John. Like I think Teal said, she hadn't talked to John in you know 30 years or something. So, so yeah, so it's you know that's that's also a, a, a tricky part of the story. Yeah, uh, uh, Kimo, you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I mean, just in, in you know, in, in documentaries in general, you have to gain trust of people. And sometimes it takes a long time. You know, you have to go to a lot of lunches with them. You got to, um, you know, which is, you know, what we did with John. You know, we, we spent a lot of time with him. We spent six months with him before we ever rolled cameras, you know, just going over to his house, having lunch mm -hmm. with them, hanging out, you know, watching UFC fights and stuff. So, you know, you just it's not something. You know, people say, like, how come you didn't interview this guy or how come, you know, it's like, well, maybe we did or may, uh, and didn't have time to put him in. Or maybe the guy turned us down. Not everybody says yes when you ask him to do an interview. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, um, you know, to all the people that are, you know, that say, like, you should have they didn't even interview this guy or whatever. You know, like, that's how documentaries are. A lot of people don't want to talk about things. Yeah. You know? So this is one of some of the challenges. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Ron, I think you mentioned already, you know, one particular person came in and maybe that put everybody else at ease. But can you actually pinpoint a moment where our, our thing, our person, where it was like, all right, this happened right here. Now, everybody's cool. Everybody can relax and come in and do this. Yeah, that's a, you know, Jerry Beck, who unfortunately didn't make the final cut. Again, it was simply a time issue. We reached out to him first. <laughs> And he's an animation historian for people who don't know. Um, he's been around for a long time. He turns out he actually worked in the same building as Spumco and, and was good friends with John. We didn't realize the depth of kind of his involvement, um, but we knew he was kind of the go-to guy when it came to animation history. Yeah. So that was really helpful because, you know, we just like, well, this cartoon, it looks cool. There's a little bit of drama, but is this going to make a movie? Is this something that people are going to want to watch? And Jerry was like the first person to say, oh, there's a lot here. You're going to uncover a lot. Not necessarily, you know, the later stuff. That was a complete surprise. But mm. but um, just about the dynamics and, and the artistry. And so even though he didn't make the film, he was really helpful and important. So that, I think, after we left that first meeting with, with Jerry, we're like, I, you know, we're feeling pretty confident there's something there. But... You know, still, it's you're talking about a divorce. So, you know, Chris Riccardi, who became good friends of ours, um, you know, on a, on a professional level, uh, 
um, he ended up calling us and saying, look, I got more to add to the story. You, would you guys mind coming to the studio? And we're like, we'll be right there. Um, <laughs> so he, you know, he was somebody that took us a while to get in contact with, but he became a huge advocate. And of course, his death is just heartbreaking for all of us. Yeah. Uh, you know, going into the, like you say, you know, some of the heartbreaking things about this story. Uh, you know, there I, I was reading about how when the film was finished and then John Kay is outed in the Me Too movement. He was outed, again, for people who don't know, he was outed, uh, I think one of the biggest things that got him out there was uh, a, a BuzzFeed article. It was a BuzzFeed article about uh, him having a, an inappropriate relationship with a girl who, when he met her, probably as young as 13, 14. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, he, and, and you know, there she she accuses him of having a inappropriate relation, an inappropriate relationship with her. Uh, it made the movie a problem now because you're celebrating somebody who is considered at this moment uh, a deviant, someone who uh, was beloved and, and is now pretty much publicly scorned. Um, he he, you know, he agrees to talk to you uh, six months. I, was it six months after? Because so he did the, he did the, uh, uh, came in for the documentary when you were very positive towards his image, and then the accusations no, actually, come in. No, he he wasn't he wasn't involved in that first film. Really? He tried? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, you know, we told the story in archival footage and uh, stills, etc., through other people, and you know, it was kind of cool because it gave John this mystique, you know, the the creator that you never see in the movie, and um, you know, it worked for the story we were telling. But no, he he had refused to be interviewed until that news broke, and then you know he changed his mind. So. And then from wow. that point on, when we first heard from Richard Purcell that he was interested, it took at least another six, maybe even more months um, to get him to actually agree to be on camera. And then we shot three different interviews with him over three separate days, which in itself, I think the first one is in early September and the last one, it was like in mid-October. So even that, you know, took some time. That's incredible, man. That worked, you know, that works backwards of any other situation like this, man. You know, uh, you feel, yeah, I mean, that was the life. opposite of way it well, works. That's why we have to tear the whole film apart, you know, because we have this brand new character now. That's a huge part. So that's what I was talking about earlier is trying to figure out now retelling this entire story with this brand new person involved. And so, yeah, it was, it was a whole rework. It was a lot. So, OK, now this isn't me insinuating anything. I'm just asking because it seems like it might be a question that people would ask. And it might be a little sure. it might be a dark question. It might be a harsh question. But okay. you get this information uh, about you finish the film and you get this information now about how this guy is accused of having this 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 inappropriate relationship with this minor. And 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 are, are you thinking? Are you panicked and thinking like, okay, this is never going to get released? Or are you thinking, well, I would never wish this tragedy on anybody. This is horrible, but this is going to make this a whole lot better. You know, I don't know. I, you know, what are you thinking behind this now? You know, it, it, the first thing that goes through your mind is, hey, we just put our life savings into a movie that nobody's going to want to see. I mean, that, honestly, uh, from a very, you know, kind of selfish point of view, like, holy, not not to say that we didn't have empathy for, you know, his victims, um, you know, as much as you can from a distance, um, not knowing them. So that, that was the first thing. And then the second thing was like, well, how the heck are we going to fix this? Or can do we just wait it out? You know, it was a lot of problem solving and kind of weighing like, well, what's the worst case scenario and what's the best case scenario? And, you know, when that first broke, it wasn't like the news broke and, and on that Thursday and John called us up on Friday morning. It still took some front time for, you know, that kind of answer to, or, you know, that request to come back to be interviewed. So. So it was it was a lot of panic, to be honest. And then the other part of it is, you know, we had no idea what Robin was going to be like. You know, there's this accusation where, you know, we're yeah. the looks of it and certainly from the article and, and how John responded. We're assuming it's true. But we had no idea what Robin was going to be like on camera. Was she just going to be angry, which she had every right to be? Um Or is she going to be a, a greater asset to the film? And it turned out she, you know super self-aware, super articulate, very smart, not just about her situation, but, 
you know, about art and artists and how you view the work. And so in that respect, you know, I, I, we got very lucky. Of course, we we hate that it came on the back of what happened. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, OK, so. You mentioned that it's, you know, hanging out uh, with with uh, John Kay is kind of what it took to actually kind of get uh to get uh, uh, him to, to speak. So Saturday nights, a lot of Saturday nights spent, you say, watching uh, UFC fights, a lot of yep. phone calls with him. So during this time, and this is, uh, this is after these, uh, the, you know, this, this information comes out. Do you actually bond with him? Do you become friends with him? Yeah, look, I mean, we're, we're filmmakers and um, do we excuse what he did? No, absolutely not. And, it still is incredible that there are people that are like, well, you like a pedophile or, you know, it's like, <laughs> folks, let's take a time out. If we have to explain to you as two normal human beings that we are against pedophilia, uh, let's not even start this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> because clearly uh, it's going to be like talking to a brick wall. So let's just get that out of the way. John, what he did was wrong. He understands it to what depth we can argue for days. Um, but let's just get that out of the way. So as another human being, yes, we developed a professional friendship with him. And, uh, you know, if you are going to get somebody on film and you are going to start to understand the why that this happened, which is hands down the most important part, because what we've said time and time again is it's one thing to punish somebody. But if you can prevent all this by showing somebody's story as a um, as a warning, then the world is going to be a better place. And you're not going to be able to tell that story unless you gain the trust of the other person and really hear them and understand them. And um, that doesn't mean you excuse them. Just, and I think if this story tells anything about humanity is that there are some people, many of us, maybe all of us, that are extraordinarily extraordinary in one way and not so great in others and really awful and, and maybe, uh, you know, to that, to that degree. So nobody's, I hate to say this, this sounds very trite, but nobody is a perfect individual in totality. We've yeah. all in some varying degrees have done awful things. John just happens to be the extreme on either side. Yeah. Kimo, what do you, uh, and let me just say before uh, I even pass over to Kimo, I wasn't I hope my tone to come across like you, you're friends with that guy. What, <laughs> are you crazy? This is no, done. You know, I, was, <laughs> I, I think you, you're, you, you nailed it when you asked the question because you said, hey, look, a lot of people are going to have this question. And and you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it would be no you know, it's a different set of circumstances, but it would be no different than a documentarian going in and interviewing a serial killer. You know what I mean? You, yeah. It's the same kind of thing. They did awful things. But at some point. You know, they probably had some severe damage in their childhood or what have you that made that person the way they are. So let's figure out what is occurring here and cut it off before it even gets to the point where young women are being traumatized. Yeah. Chemo, how do you uh, you want to respond to? Uh, I couldn't have said it better. Actually, Ron pretty much summed it up there. But I mean, you know, John is a likable guy. He, he's got a great personality. I mean, he's a quirky guy, but you can't help but to like the guy. Um, you know, and you spend six months with somebody, um, you know, that's going to, and it, it's, it is like you, you, you hear when you see these detectives that do interview serial killers, they walk out of there going, wow, that guy would have been a great guy to hang out with. <laughs> <You know>? um, <laughs> totally. So that's just kind of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty much what Ron said. It's just, you know, same feelings. Well, if you think about those personality types, too, you know, if there's narcissism or whatever, they, those people tend to be super dynamic and interesting and fun and, you know, somebody you'd want to hang out with. Part of the reason he probably got himself into trouble, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, OK, so keeping along these lines right here, there's one there's actually a couple of moments in the documentary that. I think really stands out from a lot of documentaries. Uh, you capture some uh, you capture some 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 moments, man, some small moments that I think say a lot. Uh, maybe I, I and also I could be reading into something that's not not there. But I'm going to show this scene here. There's a, there's one scene that really stood out to me. And it's uh, we finally talk about 
you know, because we've been going on and on about the history of Ren and Stimpy. And actually, there's been, you know, they've been talking about uh, John K. And they've talked about how he has a dark side as someone who is a, a leader and someone with an ego and uh, someone who's probably uh, uh, has a vision to a fault. But through all that, you know, it's mostly kind of praising him. You finally get to this point in the documentary where it gets to uh, this, the, you know, the real dark stuff, the inappropriate relationship. And he's so confident and full of energy when, you know, during most of the, the, of the documentary. But you get to this one part here where you start talking to him about Robin Bird, the girl that he met when she was very young. And where he was so animated before and so confident and even funny and, 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 and charismatic. Now, he, to me, this is what it looks like. I'm going to show this clip. He looks like he's, he's all of a sudden gotten quiet. He has these ticks where his eyebrow starts going up and down. He's scratching his arm. And I don't know. That, that, let me show the clip and I'll ask you the question that I want to ask you with this. Uh, mostly is, the, is it if it's something that you noticed him during, during during the whole interview or is it something that happened when you started asking them, asking him these uh, these really uncomfortable questions? You are um, protecting all of the little girls who never put their crayons away. What would you say to her? You know, you could, I mean, it almost looks like you're interviewing or interrogating a person. And I, I would think that anybody in the FBI or, you know, anybody was looking at this, they'd be like, I can just, I mean, these, these mannerisms are way obvious that this person is guilty and uncomfortable. Uh, but again, maybe it's something that I didn't see uh, because I wasn't there. Uh, was that when he, was he getting nervous when you were asking him hard questions and acting like that? Or did he do it the whole time? Yeah, you know, that that's a great observation. And, and I think, you know, kind of zooming out for a second, one of the things that was really important to both of us is taking an approach where we just showed you what happened. We weren't going out there even before John's news broke to make judgments on the show or any particular artist or, of course, John's behavior that we found out later. It was really about just presenting all this to folks in a way that wove a story so you could start to understand the why it, of it happened. And so, you know, this scene was of course critical to understanding both who John is now, mm -hmm. John's history, and how, you know, he, what happened with Robin. I mean, so it's, it's interesting that you pick up on that because there's a lot of that stuff is kind of threaded throughout the documentary. And if you're not really paying attention, you may just kind of blow it off. But um, he he was tricky at times during the interview. Um, you know, he obviously wanted to concentrate on what was most important to him, which is cartoon and cartoon making. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes trying to pull him off of those topics was a bit of a challenge. But overall, you know, he's a pretty dynamic guy. And in front of the camera, you know, he with the, you know, sometimes it was tough in the beginning, you know, like he needed to warm up. But, yeah. you know, he was he, he did not appear nervous until we had to, you know, kind of put the screws to him on that. Those a couple of those tougher questions, yeah. which he knew were coming. You know, we, we, we it wasn't like this gotcha journalism. That was also something with everybody that we interview. We don't ask them to sign a release until the very end because we want them, A, to feel 100 percent comfortable to talk to us and B, um, to walk away and feel like, you know, they didn't get, um, you know, uh, coerced into saying something and now they're going to regret it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kimo, you want to add anything to this? Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, he's a human being. So like anybody, if you ask them about their favorite thing in life is they're going to be incredibly passionate and right. enemy about that. And when you ask them something super uncomfortable, which they really wish would just go away, um, <laughs> you're going to act like he did, you know, and I, I, you know, it's just, it's not something he wants to talk about. And um, so, yeah, he is going to change his demeanor. I mean, I couldn't, Im I couldn't even imagine what would have happened if he was incredibly animated. About that. <laughs> <laughs> that part, you know. I don't know. I don't know. But it, so yeah, it's just you know the guy li has lived and breathed cartoon his whole life, and so naturally that's what he really wants to talk about. And so when you derail him from that, 
and he gets into positions where he isn't prepared or doesn't know, you know, have the, you know, it's not so technical, then, uh, you know, it's, you're going to get what, what you got with us. So. Yeah. Why, why, why do you think that he decided to come out and speak then? You know, because he obviously is very nervous about it and uncomfortable with it. He didn't talk to you about, you know, when you were making the documentary about the things that, you know, he loved and, 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 and enjoyed to do then. But when all this information comes out, then he opens up to you, decides to approach you. What, why do you think he did that? You know, it's, I guess I can only say it's conjecture. Um, I, I think it, a lot of it had to do, you know, because we talked about a lot about his legacy and the importance of the show to him. And, you know, he's, like I said, he's, he's, he's gone through uh, this. Let me uh, preface this by saying this does not excuse his behavior. Mm-hmm. Just so we're all clear on that. Uh, it's amazing that I still have to say these kind of things, but I do. Um, so it doesn't excuse his behavior, but he, and he went through some very, um, you know, traumatic times, which we talk about in, in the film. And, you know, so, um, sorry, I just lost my, t- it's so funny because seeing that clip, I kind of go back to there and it, it's such a, <laughs> um, it, it's, yeah, it's a little disturbing, but anyway, um, yeah. it, it's, you know, uh, I totally lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Can you ask the question again? I got totally derailed. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And, and you know, if I'm, if I'm asking you anything that's like this, no, 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 it's that, fine. It's fine. I just, I, my mind started to wander. That's part of my ADD, but sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's again? cool. Uh, no, I was just asking, why do you think that if he's so uncomfortable talking about this, why would he agree to come and oh, do this yes, after yes, the fact? Yes, sorry. So, yeah. So he, you know, what, what's so very sad um, about this is, you know, the, the one thing that, you know, is his legacy. You know, he got fired. He was, you know, at that point, he was kind of cast aside. It's not like the show ran a super long time. It's not like, you know, it's the Simpsons where it's this kind of part of the the zeitgeist Mm -hmm. for the last 30 years. So it was this very small moment in time where he he was the brightest star in entertainment. I mean, he's like next to Jerry Seinfeld. You know what I mean? Like, so now this news breaks and, and now you know, what he held up as the one shining moment in his life is now tarnished, you know? So I imagine there was, and again, this is conjecture, but speaking to him, it seemed like, well, if there's anything I can do to at least save the show, because that's, you know, that's the only thing I kind of have left, you know what I mean? But of course, as filmmakers, we're not going to shy away from the fact that, you know, he did these awful things and allow him to address it. Um, which, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking, honestly, to see how he addresses it. You know, I'm not going to get into too much detail, watch the film, but if you have any kind of sense of humanity, you will look at that apology and, you know, it's, it's pretty stunning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, 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 I told you there were a couple of things that really stood out to me as, uh, you know, where this stands out ab- uh, above the average documentary. Uh, there was that moment right there where you caught that moment, that very uncomfortable moment with him. But also there's a moment where uh, I, now I don't know who's doing the uh, the questioning here, but there's a there's a moment in the documentary where you ask him. And I think it's even you show a little bit of it in the trailers right here. Uh, you ask him, do you do you think that you could have done anything different? And he responds with. Uh, that's an impossible, that's an impossible uh, question to answer. And then somebody just claps back real quick. No, it's not. <laughs> and I'm like, and at first that I'm like, damn. <laughs> and I'm like, well, shit, yeah, man. I, uh... <laughs> you, you know, what, what is this? Is that just your, is that just your interviewing, inter- interviewing style? Whoever asked that question, I came back at him like that. I would, did that come from more of a personal place now that you had been hanging out with him for a little bit? You know, I, I think it's twofold. It's a little bit of just my personality, I would say. Um, and that's why Chemo is just the most unbelievable friend and partner because he doesn't take that part of me seriously. <laughs> yeah. Uh, th- those are one of many reasons in addition to being an enormously talented, but that's a uh, given looking at the film and his work. <laughs> but, but, um, yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, when I think one of the things going back to earlier, 
about just, you know, this kind of intellectual laziness that's going on with, you know, people wanting to be told, um, you know, what they need to think because now CNN, yeah. everything's commentary or Fox, everything's commentary. There's, uh, we find a real intellectual laziness even amongst the press where they're not like, Trump, what the hell are you saying? That's a clear lie. I'm like, like put these people to task. That's mm -hmm. what the press is there for. And I, I wouldn't say that we're hardcore journalists by any means, but when somebody says something that clearly needs to be answered, then, you know, press him. You know, you don't have to punish the guy, but like, you know, force him to reckon with it, too, you know. Um, and that's the same thing that happened with, you know, his apology. It's like, dude, let's dive in a little deeper here. You're not going to sidestep this. And um, that's, you know, it's important for the film. It's important, you know, as a human being, like, yeah, we became friendly with him. So let's let's, you know, John, let's let's be frank here, you know. Yeah. Kimo, uh, you want to add to that? Yeah, just that, you know, in when you're shooting uh, delicate subjects, we'll say, you know, you can't start off the first day of the interview and just start hammering people. It's not going to work, you know. So, <laughs> um, so that interview, the clip that you showed is from our second uh, day that we shot with him. And, and, you know, you start to ramp things up a little bit, you know. So there would be times where, you know, we would we would be – asking him questions about cartoon or whatever. And then, you know, he would go and do something and then we'd kind of look at each other and be like, you know, okay, we need to like yeah. ratchet it up a little bit and start a little bit, you know? Yeah. And so you, you, you kind of delicately start to sort of push your subject. And, and, and at that point you're sort of testing, you know, the waters and to see yeah. how people are going to react. And we, you know, and, and, and then you sort of adjust accordingly. So, but um, but like, you know, Ron was saying, there was no gotcha questions. I mean, he got everything in advance and, yeah. um, you know, and so, yeah, it just it was it was part of that part of his, um, you know, of how I know Ron is, you know, um, <laughs> but it's also part of like the amping up process of, of your subject and trying to like get a little deeper than just the surface level of a, how a cartoon is made. You know, we wanted to kind of get deeper than that yeah so what you're saying is ron don't take no shit no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, go on, ron. uh so i want to ask you guys a, a question about the show itself going back to that and then we might touch before we finish uh, back on something else with uh robin bird real quick but you guys just getting into uh ren and stimpy when doing this documentary you know now for a lot of people they have feelings about uh, to, still today, you know, uh, feelings about this, regardless of what the creator did, people still feel very close to this, very nostalgic for it. Uh, and so there's news that just came out. I'm looking at this on the Hollywood Reporter, but there's news that just came out that uh, Ren and Stimpy, it says they're pretty much confidently revived at Comedy Central, which means that they're working on this again. I doubt that they'll have John Kay involved. Uh, they don't really have any listings of who uh, will be on, on the creative team here, but you guys knowing John K, you guys knowing so much about the history now, spending years putting this together, uh, and you guys knowing now about not only uh, Ren and Stimpy, but also the the impact that this has had on pop culture and the fans that love it. How do you feel about this, as newcomers to this, how do you feel about this being remade? Do you think that this is something that can be possible, or do you look at this as like, nah, they're going to mess this all up? It's a possibility. I mean, you know, I think it's more of a possibility to the new fans, like new fans of animation. But if you're somebody who grew up with this show and loved it, and had it in your heart this whole time, like seeing this new reboot, I can't imagine someone liking it or you're just not going to get the same feeling, you know, the same, yeah. you know, it's all, it's, you know, so much of Ren and Stimpy was, was subtle and it was uh, subconscious, you know, like a lot of the stuff they did. So, um, yeah. and it was heavily, you know, there's a lot of psychosis involved in that show. I would say that there are people that would like, it would probably be more new, newer to the animation world than, than the actual fans that grew up with it, loving loving the show because it's just it was lightning in a bottle is what they achieved and you're yeah. just not going to get that again. So, yeah. um, you know, yeah. that's the lot. Yeah, 
Yeah, and you know, look, Bob Camp took over the show when when John left, and um, guys joined him like Ron uh, Hauge, who is you know an extraordinary comedy writer, which yeah. we got to meet and become friends with. And you know, those episodes were, uh, or at least an episode that I, uh, I recall was nominated for an Emmy. And so there, there was you know some certainly good subsequent episodes that Vince or or sorry uh, Chris Riccardi did. Yeah. Um, so you know, it, it's possible, but if you don't have Bob who's like kind of, kind of holding the last vestiges of the original. And then you don't, of course, we'll have John. It's, it'll be very interesting to see, as Kimo said, like how that breaks down. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those, uh, I'm old enough now to where I'm not, uh, I don't feel privileged. I don't have ownership over every, over anything. I'm not crying about this. It's, believe me, this worse things to like worry about right now than a remake of Ren and Stimpy but you know it does it does make me worry when I hear something like reimagining when you know uh, you don't have the original people there and like you said uh, uh, Kimo it was lightning in a bottle at the time it will definitely be interesting uh, and forgive me if I ask you a question that you hear all the time I didn't mean to pose that oh, to no, you no. again it's okay uh, Jesus Corey I know I know <laughs> stupid stupid uh <laughs> No, this is great, man. This is one of our more enjoyable interviews. Oh, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Good stuff. So before we close a couple of things right here. Um, so the, the, you know, a, a theme here would be separating the artist from the art and all that kind of stuff, man. You know, I'm sure that people have brought that up to you before. So uh, and, I don't, and again, I don't know if this has been asked of you, but going back to, to Robin Bird, man, she... Uh, so she put a uh, she put a petition out, and the petition is to pretty much stop Viacom from going in and redoing Ren and Stimpy. Here's a petition right here. Uh, whether John K is involved or not, which he's not, uh, but she feels like here's 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 a quote from her. Uh, this man used Ren and Stimpy to lure young people to his studio and into his confidence, only to abuse them, stunt their careers and molest young girls. He will not do it again. Not only that, but seeing his characters come back to life will traumatize many of his victims. So He will do it again. He, 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 oh, yeah, he would. No, that's what it's in capitals. Yeah, he, I'm sorry. Did I say he will not? I'm hey, sorry. Not. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I didn't mean I don't know. But I'm like you now. I feel guilty. Am I supporting this guy subconsciously? You know? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, he, will, he, he, uh, he will do it again. Uh, if he's allowed to. So I guess our argument is if if this show comes out, it's going to put him back in the spotlight. And she believes that this could possibly put him back in the spotlight for some in a, in a positive way. Do you think that it is right to punish the property and kind of bury it, even though he's not going to be involved? How do you feel about this petition? Wow, that's a, that's a really tough question. Actually, I hadn't seen it. I heard rumblings about it, but I hadn't actually seen the seen the petition. Um, you know, that's, God, that's a tough question. And, you know, uh, I certainly we feel for Robin. And um, on the other side, you have Viacom that's invested all this money. And, and um, you know, this, this is the world we live in. I just, I'm not, I'm not making any judgment like, oh, Robin's life is worth less than this amount of money. And that's, that's not what I'm saying at all. So let's just be clear on that. Um, I, I think the bigger issue, and, and this this is a question everybody has to answer for themselves, because going back to kind of how you started, it's art versus artist. And, you know, the, the kind of harshest way to put that question is, are the needs of the few greater than the needs of many if the needs of the many aren't quite as strong as those needs of those few? Meaning... John did horrible things to a relatively small group of people considering the number of fans that there are out there. There are a lot of fans out there that we spoke to that said, the last time that I saw my mom smile before she died of cancer was when I was watching Renny Stippy with her. So mm. how do I tell that fan he is no longer permitted to watch Ren and Stimpy and enjoy it? First of all, I could say it until I'm blue in his face. He's not, he, you know, that's something very personal to him. And that goes with, you know, cartoons, it goes with other movies, it goes with TV shows, it goes with music. I mean, you know, we saw the awful things that Michael Jackson is accused of, and yet we hear him all the time still on the radio. 
Um, so I, I just think it has to be a personal decision. That doesn't mean we don't sponsor what Robin is saying in the sense that re-traumatizing people. And I think maybe the, the, the message is on point, but maybe the execution is something that I would like to see her and Viacom sit down and figure out, like, can we bring this back and bring joy to millions of people without re-traumatizing the victims? Yeah. I think that would probably be the best solution. That's that's what I would think. Yeah. Kimo, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, it's an individual choice, obviously, and, and Robin says it best in the movie. You know, she just says, you know, um, uh, I'm not going to ask people to tear up their toys and, and throw away their cartoons. Yeah. It's... Um, just know that there was many more people involved in the show other than John, you know? That's so, John, you know, there was, I mean, there's, there's, I, I don't even know how many people are involved in the making of it at this point. And we did a documentary on it. I mean, there was, you know, <laughs> hundreds. So um, there's all these great artists, you know, Bill Ray and the Vince Wallers, Bob Camp, you know, so these guys all were just as big a part of the show. So enjoy all their work. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's, you know, that's all I can say on it. Yeah. A uh, couple of things, and then uh, we'll be out here. It took about five minutes or so, if you, if you don't mind. Yeah, no uh, worries. I was late, so. No, no. I, <laughs> I mean, you guys have been nice enough to do this. I don't want to take up your time, but this is a very, I think this is an incredible documentary uh, for anybody who Thank really you. loves, doc, uh, uh, for anybody who loves documentaries and for anybody who really uh, even remotely enjoys Ren and Stimpy. Uh, it's an incredible history you brought up. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't want you to badmouth anybody, and please don't answer this if you don't want to. But I think a lot of people would want to know, after spending so much time with such a controversial figure as uh, uh, John Chris Falucci, Chris Falucci, or however you say his last name, that's why people call him John K. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, how, what are your personal feelings about him, if you feel like saying? Uh, a sadness, I think, you know, I mean, this is a guy who, you know, he, he didn't have the easiest upbringing. This does not, uh, you know, uh, condone what he did. I'm sure looking back, John didn't want to do what John did. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, you know, whether he will admit that or not. So that's the sadness, you know, it's a guy with incredibly talent that had these demons that took it out on those around him, not just Robin and, and others, you know, and Katie, uh, you know, the people around him too. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's going to be a really hard thing, especially as he gets older to live with, you know, and, and, you know, of course, Robin is rightfully very angry. And there's a, you know, there's a sadness there too. Like, God, man, like, as she, you know, she says in that clip, you know, all the little girls that, you know, put their crayons away or, or, you know, it's just, it's just horrible, you know? Yeah. Um, so that, that's how I would feel. Just a, a sense of sadness. Yeah. I'm going to go with uh, Ron's answer on that one, you know? <laughs> um, but I will, I mean, I, you know, I'll still say he's a, he's a, you meet him and he's a likable guy, you know, yeah. he's got a, he's got a, he's a very interesting, interesting guy. You know, um, he doesn't think like you or I do. I mean, it's, this is a guy that was been obsessed with cartoons since he was, a child and still is so um you know he he doesn't sort of live live in that same modern world that a lot of people do so i don't know it's a set, yeah it's a sense of sadness and and um you know yeah yeah just leave it at that yeah you know it's funny because you mentioned sadness and i it, it, you show him was it just was it just creative uh framing in filming, uh, and filming, you know, just something, uh, and, you know, we don't have full context of, or was, is, or is he just kind of just a, a sad person that people don't pay that much attention to like they did? I mean, you saw, you, in the documentary, you showed him at a table, I guess it was at a convention or something, and uh, you, it's, it's in, very much in contrast to early in the documentary where he's at a comic book store and there's a thousand people outside waiting to see him. Now, later on, we see him at a table drawing and people are just kind of Walking on by, uh, is is that truly the image that we that that he is today? Well, that yeah, I mean, convention thing was before the news broke, so yeah. you know that says something there as well. You know, I mean, um, you know, the guys' fans are going to be hardcore fans, you know, and most of the, I mean, we don't go to a lot of comic book conventions, but that was one of them, 
and it's a lot of really young people and they're looking for the you know the spongebobs and and whatever else is out there because i'm not a cartoon fan so <laughs> i don't know a lot of them but they're you know it's a very young audience that's going there and you have to be you know over 30 you know 30 40 years old to recognize john and, and recognize those characters when you walk by his booth so yeah, yeah. so time to just yeah. change yeah uh, yeah. Last question here. Uh, I'm going to get, you know, I told you how much I enjoyed the documentary. So if you don't mind me just Thank pointing you. out something where people say, uh, you know, here's some criticisms. Uh, sure. I read a couple of criticisms of this uh, where they, well, it was two different maybe people saying this, but it was the same criticism, actually. Uh, and it's, I don't know how, how harsh a criticism this is. It's just that uh, some people want to know what was the decision behind putting certain uh people in the documentary such as uh bobby lee who people might know as uh from uh comedian and also from mad tv back in the day and whatnot jack black everybody knows he's in there but a lot of people wondered like you know to them that seemed pretty random it's great having the the the, the crew talk and the people who are close to the business uh but the, no, the, 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 these two reviewers just seem to kind of want to know like all right that what did they why were they in there yeah, so you know that, that was in the original cut, and the and the idea was actually to interview more fans. Um, that was an idea that we had fairly early in the process, you know, um, and you know we certainly reached out to fans that are in comedy or you mm -hmm. know um, that could potentially be influenced by Ren and Stimpy because we kind of wanted to show the breadth of uh, the influence of the show. And so, you know, we reached out to a number of different comedians and, you know, Bobby Lee is somebody I've always thought was hilarious. I saw him all the time at the comedy store and he's great. Yeah. And so, and of course, Eliza, which, you know, we wanted a female comic perspective and yeah. um, Jack. Um, originally, we reached out to Jack because he had worked with John Kay on a video. Oh, that's and right. And so he had work experience with John. Um, but of course, you know, we never got into that in the, in the film. Um, so that's why those folks were in there. And, you know, it's it certainly helps too to see people that have attained a level of success in comedy that, um, you know, can speak to it in maybe yeah. uh, a broader sense than just um, a regular super fan. We also interviewed uh, Weird Al, and, you know, it was heartbreaking that we just could not fit him in. Oh. But, yeah, he is such a nice guy and, you know, had some really great things to say. But, it just, you know, if he's there for like two seconds, because that's the only way that story wise, what he's saying fits in, uh, you know, it's better off not to have him in at all, which is a bit, like I said, a bit of a heartbreaker. But yeah, so I guess it's, uh, you know, especially with the with the way it had to be retooled after the, the information broke, it was, it was such a juggling act for you to have to do all yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kimo, anything you want to add to that before we go? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we interviewed a lot of fans. Um, you know, a lot of it was Skype interviews. And unfortunately, when you get down into the cutting room, it just doesn't cut well when you have to cut to like, yeah. you know, Skype interviews and there's so many fans. And if you use one Skype interview, then you have, you know, it just, it's, there's all these things you have to juggle when you get in the interview. So we just, we ended up not going with any of the fan Skype interviews, um, even though there were some great ones, but it's just a timing thing too, uh, yeah. or a time issue. Um, so yeah. And then, um, anyone who does stream this movie, thank you. And please don't pirate it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> There's yeah. people that want to do that. So if you could just, you know, well, pay the six bucks, that'd be great. You know what I'm going to tell you, man. Uh, I, and I'm pulling up where we can find it uh, real quick. But I want to let you know that uh, I did not get the screener sent to me. So I went ahead. I didn't even rent it. I bought it oh. and don't oh, regret nice. it. So. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. Yeah, okay. I bought it, bought it off, uh, off of Amazon. So people speaking of which you can, uh, again, we have been talking to, we've been talking to uh, uh, Ron Cicero. I think I said your name right. Uh, yeah. And Kimo Easterwood, the director's of Happy Happy Joy Joy, the documentary about the history of the classic Ren and Stimpy cartoon that seemed to change from that point on, change animation, at least television animation forever, and also the rise and fall of its creator, John Crick Paluski. You can find this, I got this off of Amazon Prime. 
Like I said, I bought it. It's 10 bucks. It's not that bad. Uh, don't regret it. It's very good. It's on YouTube. Uh, I know it's also on iTunes. Any place else that people can find this that you want to let people know? Yeah, Corey, I can send you a link. It's it's pretty much anywhere VOD is. So anything from Sony to Xbox to you know anywhere you Redbox, anywhere you normally stream. So it's it's available. A DVD comes out in uh, early October. Here's a good question. Somebody said, "What platform will give the best royalties? Will you benefit from the most?" Ah, oh, that is really sweet. Um, you know, I don't even know to be quite honest. That's a really <laughs> good question. I suppose I should have asked that. Um, but thank you very much. I, you know, I think they were pressing iTunes just because of the, uh, you know, the cachet of Apple. But um, so if you want to do it there, that would be great. But uh, you know, wherever you can get the film, we really appreciate it. And to Kimo's point, please don't pirate it. You're looking at the two guys that finance this thing. Uh, nobody makes a Ren and Stimpy documentary to uh, get rich. So <laughs> we, we just want to break even at this point. Wow. So you self-financed? Yeah. Yeah. Sold a house. Got rid of a car. Wow. We we're all that... in, man. We, we, we didn't expect it, but we we're all in. That is uh, that's amazing. That somebody, the asylum in the chat says, you two seem cool. <laughs> so I think you just got way more cool these people. By the way, I don't know if that's a green screen run, but it looks awesome. All right, that's a, that's a fake background, but it looks awesome. And this is my mansion. And and Kimo, I was gonna say, from all the money I made off the documentary, <laughs> I'm right yeah, you and me both. This is my loft. I, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Ren and Stimpy's of uh, uh, fame and fortune is our fame and fortune, and John K's shame is our fame and fortune. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wish my wife was in here, uh, Kimo, to see your your background. She would love your decorating. Uh, all right. Yeah. No. Yeah. She's- Welcome to it. I yeah. <laughs> hey, Kimo, tilt up on that painting. Isn't it for sale, I think? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, put it, put it out there, man. We'll, you know, she might buy it. She's all in the interior decorating, man. Uh, all right. Good taste. Hey, guys. Uh, again, uh, incredible way to wrap that up, too, just hearing how you self-finance that because it, people, go, go watch this. I mean, if... I would say do it to support, but I'm not saying to support, man. I'm saying that, yes, you'll support, but it's actually a very good documentary and not just for people who are fans of Ren and Stimpy. Go watch this. Available wherever you can platform or whatever, wherever there are platforms that stream, you can find this. So, guys, once again, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you taking the time. Our pleasure. Thanks so much. We're here to make this documentary. So, What's that? It was four years to make this documentary, so just so people have an idea of how much time we put into it. There you go. People, time and money, man, if they put in there all their own. These guys are true artists right here, and they love their passion. They follow it, so we always endorse that. Hey, like I said, that, mean, that meant a lot to me. You took me back to some really, really cool times, man. You know, like I said, thank, I got to thank you for the memories, so appreciate right. it. Right on. Hey, uh, you. you guys, uh, again, anything you want to promote before you go besides this? You doing anything next? Uh, we're pitching a lot of pitching right now. So a lot of docu series and long form series. So we will definitely let you know because this has been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, please do. I just enjoy talking to you guys. I mean, I don't do this. I'm not doing this for the money either. I just enjoy having conversations <laughs> with people. So you guys have been a pleasure to talk to. I'll let you go. Thank you. And and, and, and seriously, if people say good luck with everything, but I mean it, man. You've done such a Thank great you. job with this, whatever your endeavors are. I, I, I hope you uh, I hope you reach them and you have our full support. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank Corey. All right, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. And there Ooh. they go. Ah oh, man, thank you guys too out there for your support. Appreciate that for all of those who have been watching. Uh, I, you know, I've always promised to go in and have you guys ask questions. Maybe I'll get questions from you ahead of time. Uh, I see a lot of people here right now. But thank you, man. Thank you. And I hope that you guys enjoyed this, the Toasties out there. Thank all you Toasties out there for supporting and for watching this. I hope uh, that was enjoyable for you. And I mean it, man. Go watch that documentary. It's it's actually very good. Very good. Uh, so when people say don't pirate something, uh, you, you know me, man. I'm I, There's a gray area with that. I don't know. I, you know, I don't. I'm not one to come out and say, don't pirate. I'm not one to come out and say, do pirate. Everything kind of has its own situation. But if the people are pirating this, that's a shame because as you heard these guys say, they spent four years making this and they spent their own money on this too. Uh, Sold cars and houses and everything to get this done to bring this to you. 
So please go out and support them. And check this out. And support us. Uh, folks, please subscribe if you can. Keep the channel going. Get yourself a free subscription with that Amazon Prime account. Please renew it when the time comes around. And hopefully we can get other means of support from you and create new content for you. Speaking of animation, you know I love Ren and Stimpy because I love animation. Uh, we're going to be trying to bring you animation right here. And we're going to try to do that with your support when our Patreon comes around. I say when, uh, it's an if right now, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. So again, thank you guys. Hey, if you have any questions for me before we go, let me know. I mean, I'm not the spotlight here today. It was those two. But if you have anything you'd like to ask before we go, let me know. Let me know. I'll put it up here today. Is there 8-Bit Crumbs today? No, 8-Bit Crumbs is on Thursdays and on Saturdays. And even Saturday is going to be changing because we were, we've gotten the support right now. Look, I said I haven't signed anything, but we got the support from Twitch to do a trivia show. I will not be there. Uh, my dop, my my <laughs> my robotic doppel doppelganger will be there. The Cory bot. Um, let me see here. Watch party tonight. Yes, I forgot to tell you. Watch party is tonight. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am, whoever asked that. Uh, yeah, we have a watch party tonight at 8.30 on DoubleToasted.com. Whoa! I guess, uh, let's see here. People, I got to go. I got to check out our garage. Hold on. Hold on. Hello? Oh, oh hey, how you doing? I'm fine. Are you here? Okay. Okay. Uh, no, I'll be ready for you. I'll see you here. All right. Thanks. Bye. Well, that gives me enough time to go in and say goodbye to you guys. Uh, we'll see you tonight, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on The Watch Party. That Again, that is on uh, DoubleToasted.com. You'll find out what the movie is. We'll put it on social media today. Join us tonight. We'll see you there. We're going to have some fun with that. And I got to go because we have a repairman coming by. So there we go, folks. Thank you so much once again. I'll see you on the next one, which, as I told you, will be very soon. Uh, get a hold of us. In the meantime, kcoolmans at gmail.com. That's K-C-O-O-L-M-A-N-Z at gmail.com. You email us with any kind of questions, comments, compliments, insults, and financial advice. Hit us up on the social medias, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Got the details right there. Copy them down, memorize them, love them, and use them. And, folks... As I told you, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, big Rona out in them streets. So when everything is fine, we welcome you back to Austin. That time is not now, though. So until then, email us. Tell us your plans for Austin, whether you are moving here or just passing through. Either way, when it's safe, we'll try to be ready for you. And hopefully, once again, safely accommodate you. All right, everybody, that is it. Had a great time with you today, and we got to get out of here. Good night, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you are listening to or you just happen to be watching this. Goodbye and stay toasty.